Welcome to the NJ Criminal Podcast. Welcome back to New Jersey Criminal Podcast. Here with us today is Christopher Mogg, Enterprise Reporter for the Record in USA Today. Chris spoke with us back in December uh, about an article that he had done on the Teterboro Airport and how it related uh, to the uh, trial of Glenn Maxwell. Uh, and Chris is back today speaking with us about uh, a different article that he wrote uh, back in February of 2020 uh, related to a serial killer uh, right here in New Jersey. Uh, the uh, Khalil Wheeler Weaver uh, was charged uh, and was ultimately found guilty by a jury uh, on December 19th, 2019, uh, and was sentenced this past October, 2021. Uh, and so, Chris, I'm going to turn it over to you to uh, describe the unbelievable events, really, uh, leading up to uh, Wheeler Weaver's arrest and ultimate conviction. Great. Sure. Thank you for reaching out to me on this. Yes. Yeah, so, um, Everything about this case was rare, was horrific and also rare. Uh, one might get the sense from all of the docudramas and news coverage that um, serial killers are common. Um, they're really not. Uh, <laughs> there are very few serial killers in the world. And um, when I heard that my, I, I work for, as you mentioned, the record newspaper and USA Today, and one of our Local reporters found out about this case in which a serial killer uh, was, was standing trial. And um, he stood trial because he's <laughs> uh, the worst he could get would be life in prison. Um, and uh, there's no way that he would get less than that. So mm -hmm. um, he stood trial. He didn't. There, there was nothing to uh, settle for. Um, everything about the case was exceptional. The fact that the um, killer and all of his victims were black. Um, it's pretty rare in this small group of uh, serial killers. Um, the fact that his, his third victim uh, would have been his third murder, but it wound up, uh, am amazingly, she wound up escaping. Her name is Tiffany Taylor. And uh, her testimony, uh, and before she testified, her uh, going to the prosecutor's office. Well, yeah, let me let me tell that chronologically. Mm -hmm. Tiffany Taylor had been attacked and very nearly killed by a Khalil Wheeler Weaver in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Um, she had a pretty terrible interaction with Elizabeth police officers when she attempted to tell them about that attack. And yet she went to the arraignment for Wheeler Weaver when he was arraigned on the murder of Sarah Butler, a Montclair resident. Um, at that point, police only knew about Sarah Butler. They thought they had uh, arrested a man who had killed one person. Tiffany Taylor said he did the exact same things to me. He attempted to strangle me, he raped me, and he attempted to kill me. Um, that was the first that the prosecutors knew that they had a serial offender on their hands in custody. Uh, without Tiffany Taylor taking a pretty big risk, um, she's a uh, on again, off again, sex worker and on again, off again, uh, addict in some ways. Um, her going to the police was really brave and she created this case really for, for the prosecution. Uh, this, the third rare, incredible part of this case was the way in which police finally did find and, uh, come to see Wheeler Weaver as a suspect. Um, Sarah Davis's friends, Sarah, I'm sorry, Sarah Butler's friends, um, knew all of her internet passwords, uh, for different dating sites and Facebook and email. Um, they also knew that she had been last seen and last been talking about going on a date with a man that she had met on a social media site called tagged. Um, they knew his uh, screen name. They didn't know his real name. They knew his screen name was uh, screen name was Little Yacht Rock. So using her password, Sarah pa Sarah's passwords, they went on to tag, created a fake profile, and um, reached out to Little Yacht Rock, and 
within minutes, he responded in the exact same aggressive way that he had solicited Sarah Butler, uh, immediately asking for sex in return for money. They catfished um, him. So, yeah, they catfished him. And they catfished him while they were standing in the Montclair Police Department. Uh, so really putting themselves at great risk um, if he had heard uh, – they, they did wind up speaking to him by phone, still standing in the police department. If they had heard any of the back – if he had heard any of the background chatter of them being in a police department, perhaps things could have gone very differently in this case. Um, so, But he's not arrested that day, right? The, the police do, in fact, uh, interact with him, but at that point – they don't have anything to hold him, right? Yes. Uh, that's how they came to know about his existence. But they didn't have a crime. At this point, uh, they had no evidence of a crime being committed. Uh, Sarah Butler was an adult. She was 19 years old. And kind of uh, the, the standard police line in cases like this is it's not illegal for adults to leave, to go other places. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, and they hadn't yet found uh, her remains. So uh, they treated him as a person of interest. They, um, he actually went on two different ride-alongs, Khalil Wheeler Weaver did, with two different police departments, uh, both Montclair and with the Union New Jersey Police Department, uh, lying to them all the while about his whereabouts and uh, driving around with his victims both of whom he said he left the car with both of them alive and driving away. Not, none of that was true. Um, but his, uh, his father and his uncle were, are both, no, I'm sorry, his stepfather and his uncle of Khalil Wheeler Weaver, both were longtime police officers. One was a well-respected detective in Newark. Um, and so he knew how to speak with police officers. He was very comfortable doing that. And so he, uh, was able, and until they found Sarah Butler's body um, in Eagle Rock Reservation, he, and even after that, he believed he would be able to bluff his way out of any communication with police. He, he, even after the body was found, he kept lying and continued bluffing. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, it, should, it should be noted, as I think you said in the beginning, that um, the, the one woman that was friends with him uh, that ultimately showed up at the arraignment, uh, the one mm -hmm. woman that, that he was not able to kill that had escaped, uh, she yeah. also had called the police on, on that day uh, and, you know, again, kind of slipped through, through their fingers, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, that's the most egregious. The, 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 I think there are, in going back over this case more recently, I think there are two obvious egregious missteps by police departments in two different New Jersey municipalities. Um, the first was in Union Township. So um, when uh, Robin West went missing, her friend went to Union Township and said, um, I haven't heard from Robin. That's really strange. Uh, here is the license plate of the man she left with. Here's a description of him, uh, of his silver BMW. Um, Union police eventually did uh, follow up on that lead. They uh, tracked uh, Khalil Wheeler Weaver's license plate to his home where he lived with his parents. Um, he took them on a driving tour in which he said to them, um, "I yes, I did see this woman. Uh, I didn't know her as Robin West. I knew her as a different name. Um, and uh, he described them as having went to middle school together, which doesn't make any sense since Robin West grew up in Philadelphia, nowhere near his home in Orange. Um, and I left her off here near this warehouse um, in New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> everything about that is incredible because a week later, a house burned almost to the ground, and that's where... Uh, the remains were found eventually for Robin West. So even after the fire, even after those remains were found, and it took months to identify those remains because they were so badly burned, the Union Township Police never went back to Khalil Wheeler Weaver and said, why did you lie to us? Right. You would you have thought they woman. would have renewed their interest in him uh, at that yeah. point in time. 
And that's yeah, just they had just obvious to be, warnings. Yeah. Just to be clear, where we are chronologically, the at the point in time uh, when you, when you wrote your article in, in February of two thousand and twenty, right? We were unaware of this more recent uh, individual, but there was four yeah. four women attacked in in a span of eighty four days in the summer and fall of two thousand and sixteen. Three of whom yes. were murdered. Yes. And Thank so you just to, me. you know, That's just to go back over mm-hmm. this, Robin West uh, went missing uh, August 31st, right? I guess I think she was the first now, she but, you know, going back, she was the, the first chronologically yeah. um, mm-hmm. who, who was who was murdered. And you're right. This, these are all situations where friends of the victims, you know, reach out to the police and say, hey, my mm-hmm. friend, my friend went missing. Um, yeah. On, in, in, and she was the first. And then in all of these cases, um, I think probably, uh, well, no, I think all, all of them involved, uh, you know, women who uh, had, had had, you know, a, a tough time of it in life and had uh, either worked as exotic dancers or, um, you know, had traded sex for money for whatever reason um, and had come into contact with him uh, through, you know, the course of different dating apps. Is that accurate? Um, It's close. Mm -hmm. So uh, Sarah Butler um, was actually a college student in Jersey City. Uh, She did agree to meet Wheeler Weaver in exchange for uh, to, to offer sex in exchange for money, but she was not primarily a sex worker. There's no indication that she had agreed to anything like that before. Um, at Tiffany Taylor uh, did not meet him through an app. Uh, she met him through a mutual friend. Uh, it appears that they were hanging out, that that was not, uh, that relationship was not online and not sex work related. And then Bernicia, the the other two victims, um, uh, Joanne Brown, right? Robin West mm-hmm. and Joanne Brown were met on the street. Okay, okay. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, we've talked about Robin West. Joanne Brown next would be mm-hmm. um, an individual that ultimately uh, meets with with him in October, October twenty second mm-hmm. of twenty sixteen, um, mm-hmm. and. Uh, again, had been with a friend, uh, left, however, uh, without her phone, um, and is mm-hmm. ultimately found not until the beginning of December um, in a in a an abandoned home. Um, yes. But at that point in time, there's really not much to link her with Wheeler Weaver. Um, although at the end of the day, it appears that wherever he went and whoever he interacted with, he had a cell phone. Yes. Um, which at the time when her body was found, no, there there was no. She, she had been left, as you mentioned, in a in an abandoned home for many months. Uh, there was no uh, evidence linking her to uh, to to him. Um, only after police and prosecutors launched a a very major investigation they went through all of his years of his cell phone data did they discover that his phone and he had traveled to the popeyes restaurant in south orange uh south orange uh, south uh, South to uh pick up joanne brown that he took her to this house that he was there for some time and that joanne's friend uh, called her phone number, called the phone number that, that uh, I'm sorry, let me let me back up. Mm-hmm. Joanne Brown had borrowed Khalil Wheeler's phone uh, phone to call her friend and just check in. Uh, that was a way that they stayed safe while working on the street. Uh, after a time of not hearing from Joanne, her friend called that same phone number, not knowing whose number it was. Um, and Khalil Wheeler Weaver picked up, he was silent, uh, and then hung up on her. Uh, and then he called her back later and was silent again. So uh, we have these records showing both pinpointing exactly where he was and what he was doing. Maybe the most chilling of the cell phone record, um, when he started the fire 
in the also abandoned home uh, where Robin West was later, her body was later identified. We know that he was there, um, that he left. Uh, about 20 minutes later, a, a neighbor reported a fire in the house next door. And you can plot Wheeler Weaver's uh, driving. He drove uh, west on Route 280 for a few miles, circled back, drove past his own home, and then returned to the scene of the fire where firefighters from five different um, towns were fighting fire. I mean, it was a very serious fire in a neighborhood of, of densely packed wooden houses. So if they didn't act fast, they could burn up the entire neighborhood. Um, and he was watching the whole thing for an extended period of time. Um, the other creepy thing, um, we didn't really mention Elizabeth. What happened in Elizabeth was that uh, when Tiffany Taylor survived, she immediately called police. The police came and accused her of prostitution, didn't believe that she had just been attacked, mm -hmm. and threatened to arrest her for prostitution. Um, as they are, and we have video camera footage of this, as the police are intimidating this woman who just narrowly survived being murdered, we know from Wheeler Weaver's cell phone records that he was across the street watching the interaction from his car for about 10 minutes before he drove away. Yeah, he, returning returning to the scene of the crime. Yeah, in that case, he didn't leave. Right. I now, will say now she knew him. That, she oh, had sorry, known him, right? Yes, she knew him through a mutual friend. Yes. Right, and there's some indication that uh, perhaps he was angered um significantly by the fact that she had kind of tricked him or and robbed him so to speak you know when they when they were i guess for lack of a better term friendly friends right yeah what, what happened with um, that did she, that ever play sure. into uh, any motivation of his to to do what he did uh, we can only speculate on motives because he denied throughout the trial um and, uh, and continues to deny, deny that he had any part in this murder. So um, we know that he uh, asked, uh, Khalil Wheeler Weaver asked Tiffany Taylor to sleep with him. She rejected him. She thought that he was too young. Uh, she was 33 at the time. Um, and um, then he, he kind of relentlessly pursued her. Uh, Tiffany has spent, she, Tiffany's had a very hard life, and she's tired of the way that many men in her life have treated her. So she concocted a plan to say, yes, I'll meet you, and we'll have sex. Um, she brought in a purse that she didn't really care about. She went to his home, Khalil Wheeler Weaver's home, brought a purse that she doesn't care about. Um, they're about to do the act. And she says, oh, wait, I forgot my condoms. They're in the car. Let me go get the condom. He doesn't believe her. And she says, oh, you don't believe me? I'll leave my purse. Just fine. I'll leave it here on the bed. I'll go get the, the condom. He says, OK. Well, the purse was always a decoy. Uh, she had gotten his money. And as soon as she got back to her car, she fled. Uh, so he can't, he can't have taken that <laughs> very well. Uh, when he, when she, when he was attacking her and uh, she regained consciousness, he actually paused the attack to introduce himself and say, you were the one who robbed me. And later in that interaction said, I don't, it's not fair. I don't understand why I have to pay girls to be with me or, pay, or give me attention. So right, and he had targeted her and presumably would have killed her had she not been able to escape. And, and then of course, call the police and have the police then not believe her yeah. and yeah 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 the key there is that uh khalil wheeler weaver throughout this entire uh, rampage uh showed stunning levels of stupidity right and tiffany taylor is really smart right <laughs> so she just come outsmarted right and and walked into a courtroom when she you know, wasn't necessarily even uh, on anyone's radar as a potential witness. Um, yeah. So, yeah, really heroic. Right. So, I mean, it's you, you've got three 
deceased women, Sarah Butler, Joanne Brown, Robin West, um, mm -hmm. in terms of the, uh, and, that, and that's almost like a reverse chronology. Robin West is murdered on August 31st of 2016. Joanne Brown on October 22nd of 2016. Uh, You've got the intervening attack on November 15th of 2016 of Tiffany Taylor when she escapes and calls the police and uh, nothing nothing comes of it, uh, which en really enables him to commit the murder of Sarah Butler on November 22nd of 2016. And mm -hmm. it's, as you've already described, it's, it's uh, Sarah Butler's, um, is it her sister and friend, who yeah. essentially uh, are able to get back into her phone, check her dating app, uh, and 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 as we've already said, catfish him while in the police station. Uh, and again, yeah. police then interact with him, uh, and he is able to once again uh, get away. What what leads to his ultimate uh, arrest later that year? So the police already had him on their radar. It doesn't appear that he was the prime suspect of their investigation. Um, he knows how to talk to police. Um, they also did a ride along uh, with him in the backseat of the car. He was not under, you know, he was not Mirandized. He was free to go at any time. Um, but he knows how to interact with police officers. So uh, it was an amiable interaction. Uh, what changed was they found Sarah Butler's body. And it turned from a missing persons investigation to a murder investigation. Um, and there are uh, members of Sarah Butler's family and friends of the family who believe that the story in Montclair is the same as the story in Elizabeth and Union Township, where the Montclair Police Department did not take the case seriously um, because Sarah Butler is black. Um, that they kind of, that they futzed around, that they weren't doing a good job investigating. Um, I don't have enough to, to, I don't have enough to prove that they are right or wrong. I do know that when uh, Montclair police detective Falais, uh testified in trial, he gave extensive testimony and backed it up with documents about steps they took during the investigation, including himself, um, I believe doing that right along with uh, um, Wheeler Weaver on Thanksgiving Day. Um, so at least according to the evidence that that became public uh, in court, it appears the Montclair Police Department did a lot. Um, unfortunately, the um, and, and maybe was kind of categorically different than, say, Elizabeth, which really screwed this case up. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't know everything. Uh, the family declined to speak to us. As to my knowledge, they've declined to speak to all journalists about this case. So um, it's entirely possible that they know things that I don't. Right, right. You know, I, I, I read with great interest uh, your story that was in the USA Today. And, you know, it's, you're, you know, it's clear that uh, it was the women uh, that were involved in the case that really cracked it, right? Uh, as you as you know, yeah. women, yeah, police didn't crack the case. Women did. Women who had never investigated a murder in their lives. Robin Weff's yes. friend, Miss Patterson, recording the license plate. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Joanne Brown, despite being a victim, uh, called her friend, which they were able to then later, you know, see on his phone records as to where she was. Um, significantly Sarah Butler's sister and friend finding uh, evidence, right? Her, her discarded uh, hair extensions and by mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, tracking him down on the app and meeting up with him. All of those, um, all of those things uh, showed that they were hunting him uh, and ultimately yeah. led to his arrest and ultimate, ultimate conviction. Yeah, the women in this case were incredibly brave and um, resourceful, doing things that police officers um, didn't have the time or the resources to do, or in some cases, uh, 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 to their shame, didn't have the inclination to do. 
stopping Wheeler Weaver before he was able to kill more women. Um, and I think the, the widely shared regret is that had the Elizabeth Police Department taken uh, Tiffany Taylor more seriously, um, maybe been alerted to her would-be killer sitting in his car a hundred feet away watching them, uh, Sarah Butler might have survived. Right. Have. And never been attacked. Yeah. So he's arrested. He's uh, indicted in Essex County, uh, I think in February of 2017. And um, as we all know, the wheels of justice spin slowly. He's ultimately brought before a jury and they find him guilty on December 19th of 2019. Um, takes a while to get him sentenced. I did a little bit of research, and it looks like there were um, many, as there often are, but many uh, post-conviction, uh, but pre-sentencing type of um, applications made by the defense. But he, w- he was ultimately sentenced this past October uh, 6th of 2021 uh, and sentenced to, uh, what, 100 and... 65, yeah, 160, 160 years in prison. Thank you for listening in. Stay tuned for the next part in this conversation. This podcast is not a source of legal advice. No two legal cases are the same. Contact an attorney if you require legal assistance.